of Speaking, a monthly podcast on the spoken word. Episode 14, March 2019, Caribbean Voices, a conversation with Elizabeth Montoya Steeman and Dylan Paul. Hello, Paul Meyer here with my latest podcast, a service of paulmeyer.com, where you'll find all my books, ebooks, and services for spoken word training and coaching. Elizabeth is an artist and educator with an interest in acting and speech arts. She's a graduate of Teatro Libre de Bogota, I hope I'm saying that right, in Colombia, and has a postgraduate diploma in voice studies from the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London. She also has a master's in linguistics from the University of the West Indies. Her research focuses on language confidence and competence, especially the issues that future Jamaican performers face when presenting a poetic text written in standard English. Elizabeth lives in Jamaica and has been teaching at the Edna Manley College of Drama in Kingston for 20 years. She's an associate editor for Jamaica on Idea, the International Dialects of English Archive, publishing many fascinating recordings of subjects from the Caribbean. I first got to know Elizabeth when I was preparing my book, The Jamaican Dialect. She was enormously helpful. I cite her and her students throughout the book. Just Google Paul Meyer and Jamaican Dialect to find it as a hard copy or as an e-book with embedded sound files from my website or from Amazon or iTunes. Dylan Paul is also an actor and educator. He's on the faculty of the University of Idaho, where he teaches voice, speech, and heightened text. As a performer, he's currently in the world premiere company of Moulin Rouge, opening on Broadway this summer. Other credits include the Broadway Company of Cabaret, as well as productions with the Oregon, Illinois, and Houston Shakespeare Festivals, the Folger Shakespeare Theatre, and the American Shakespeare Centre. Supported by a Fulbright scholarship to Trinidad and Tobago, he studied voice and text in carnival performance. He serves the International Dialects of English Archive in multiple capacities and has introduced the Caribbean nations of Grenada, Barbados and Montserrat to the collection. He's a graduate of the University of Houston and the University of Kansas, where he trained with me. This conversation was recorded over Skype, and I'm sorry for the occasional poor quality. It was noisy in Kingston that day, and connecting three people at great distances from each other challenged my internet speeds. I found it absolutely fascinating to hear again how the, the way you talk, your manner of speaking, lies at the centre of any discussion of colonialism. Both Elizabeth, who negotiates the encounter between Jamaican Creole speakers and classical English language texts like the Bible and Shakespeare, and Dylan, who found himself voice coaching Oedipus Rex during his Fulbright stay in the Caribbean, reveal how difficult it is to mediate the encounter between an oral tradition and the literary tradition of their former colonizers. Fascinating. It occurred to me that Dylan and Elizabeth may not have met each other yet, even though they are both idea editors. So I'm going to get you guys to introduce yourselves to each other and, of course, to our listeners, but asking you to tell us what uh, drew each of you to the Caribbean. Dylan. A really bad haircut initially. <laughs> I got a haircut at the University of Houston, and uh, the stylist had this gorgeous, melodic voice that I could not shake. And I asked her for a recording, and she said, well, if you love my voice, you, you have to go to Trinidad. And <laughs> I dropped everything, and two weeks later, I was in Trinidad and Tobago. And everything went from there, honestly. While I was there, I discovered Carnival and then got wrapped up in the Fulbright. And I was already working on idea work, and that kind of pitched everything forward for me. Fantastic. Elizabeth, tell us about what drew you from Colombia to Kingston, Jamaica. 
I came here because they called me to work to teach acting and voice and speech. And then at the Adnamale College of the Visual and Performing Arts. Then after a year I left and then love brought me back. I got married here. And then since then I started working again at the Adnamale College. Well, welcome both of you. And uh, I'm so glad to have you both as associate editors of IDEA. You've both contributed wonderful mm -hmm. samples from that region. Let's talk about the Caribbean first. Let's define it for our listeners. First of all, Caribbean, Caribbean. Well, you know, some people say it one way, some people the other way. It depends on if it is uh, American or British. What's your opinion, Dylan? Sure. So I've heard it both ways. I mean, you have actually in sample one, the sample one from Barbados, you actually have demonstrations of how this is given from her perspective. And it sounds more like Caribbean, but there's a lot more equal division of stress there. I say Caribbean, but I say pirates of the Caribbean. And, and West Indies or the Caribbean? And what, what are the political overtones of West Indies versus the Caribbean region? Well, the West Indies is a group of islands that belong to the same historical and cultural background. They belong to the CARICOM, and uh, the West Indies is more British. So it's like the, the West Indies is a, has a long history of conquest and colonization. In the Caribbean, we have all these countries that get tied up together by this history and this process of colonization and decolonization. I'm looking on Wikipedia and realizing afresh what an enormous swath of the planet is covered by this region. So many countries. Cuba with the most populous at 11 million, Haiti with 10 million, Dominican Republic with 10 million. Puerto Rico with three, Jamaica with two, uh, nearly three million, Trinidad and Tobago, where you were, Dylan, with one and a half million. And Guyana is, is it Guyana or Guyana there on the South American coasts? Well, how do we pronounce that? Well, we say Guyana. That's how I've said it as well. Mm -hmm. And then Suriname and Guadeloupe and Martinique and Bahamas, Belize, Barbados, St. Lucia, Curaçao, Aruba, we'll be listening to a little Curaçao sample later from you, Dylan. The yeah. Ar Aruba, the uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which you've just contributed to wonderful samples from, from yeah. that region, Elizabeth. The United States Virgin Islands, Grenada, Antigua, Dominica, Cayman Islands, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Saint-Martin, I guess I would say, a, a little French colony of 36,000 people. The British Virgin Islands, even the Caribbean Netherlands, and Anguilla, and uh, San Barthélemy. How, how should I pronounce that? San Barthélemy. Barthélemy. Yeah, from France and Montserrat, another little tiny British dependency or colony for f a mere five thousand. So, total of forty-four, close to forty-five <laughs> million people in this huge swath. Of islands and what diversity there is among the languages. Elizabeth, tell us about the pre-Columbian languages, the Amerindians, and the colonizing languages that have left their mark on the island chain. Before Columbus came the Amerindians, as they are called, or indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, there were no homogeneous among them, and several tribes had several languages. So the groups in the Caribbean were the Caribs, the Arawaks in the Greater Antilles, and mainland territories as well. Then the Warao or Tibetans, a smaller group chiefly in the Lesser Antilles, and mainland territories in the coast and inland. So two major languages were present, the Arawak languages, Taino, for instance, and the Cariban languages. So we know that they existed because there are word lists and oral traditions. There are many words inherited from them, for instance, hammock, tobacco, potato, guava, and many other. So many indigenous populations vanished owed to European diseases, 
that they didn't have, for instance, the yellow fever, malaria, etc. And also they were fighting among with other tribes. So then the groups amalgamated and then their languages started to mix and then sh eventually they shift and then they died. Many of them died. The European languages were enforced in their respective colonies. The first group to arrive was in 1492, where Spaniards arrived in Hispaniola. And then Dutch, French, and British came in the 17th century. And then in the Caribbean, monolingualism was enforced. And many Caribbean dialects of the European languages were created. And many native languages vanished from the chain of islands in the Caribbean. And then now... The main territories of, for Amerindian languages are Suriname, Guyana, Belize, um, French Guyana. Arawakan and Cariban languages in the Guyanas. And then the Island Carib or the Black Carib and the Garifuna in the coastal areas of Belize and also parts of Honduras. And the Tupi in French Guyana. So the Spanish colonized Cuba, Dominican Republic, so now they speak Spanish in Cuba, Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico, and also San Andres in Providencia, which is an island uh, the north of Colombia. And then the French were in Haiti, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, so they speak French or French Creole mainly. The Dutch... <laughs> You see, it's a big mixture of languages. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> so Suriname, so there there were the vernacular languages like Shranantongo. And then in Suriname, the tribes are divided into two families, the Carib and Arawak. And then we have the Papiamento in the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire. Yes, and Dylan's got a little a clip so that's of uh, some Papiamento. Oh, great. Yeah, we'll be listening to that shortly. Yeah, so we have like uh, 19 countries in the Caribbean with English as an official language. Anguilla, Antigua, Barbuda, I don't know if I should read all of them. But also, all these countries have their Creoles, like a big, beautiful mixtures with uh, very strong voices and a lot of physical expressions. Yeah. And, we, um, and we really haven't yet touched on the African languages that, due to a rather unfortunate episode in, in our history, have come to the Caribbean too. So the majority of the slaves came from West Africa, and the trading was made mainly by private companies along the west coast of Africa. The main regions where slaves came from were West African in the area bounded by the Senegal River in the north to contemporary Angola, so the countries include uh, are include are sorry Senegambia, Senegal and Gambia, and then the groups spoke mostly Bambara and Wolof. Also the Sierra Leone, the Windward Coast, the Gold Coast, the Bight of Benin, Bight of Biafra, West Central Africa. So in the West Central Africa, they have the Akan and Ashanti languages. In the Windward Coast, the dominant languages are those of the crew group. And in the Gold Coast, which is Ghana today, uh, where they had the trading post of Elmina, the main languages groups were Akan. In this group, we have the Ashanti, Fante, and Agni. The other places like Slave Coast, they have Ewe and Ga. Um, the Ewe was relatively a homogeneous culture. And the main variety is Fon. In the Bight of Biafra, uh, the main languages are Yoruba, uh, Iyo, Ibo, Efik, to a lesser extent, Hausa and Fulani. And then in this West Central Africa, the Niger Congo languages are Canon, anyway, we can say. Yes. So some languages were more closely related than others, but, and some of them were mutually intelligible. And my understanding is that pretty much starting with the British abolition of slavery, then indentured servants from other parts of the globe started to come to the Caribbean to supplant that slave labor. Is this true? Yes, the indentorship period after 
slavery was abolished from India and China. So that's why, for example, here in Trinidad and Tobago, we have other languages like Hindustani, Sarnami, Spanish, Tobagonian, Creole. We have the Trinidadian English, Trinidadian, Creole, French. Dylan, let's refer to your time in Trinidad and Tobago and and the dialects and the languages that you found there. With Trinidad and Tobago, there are a lot of dialectical and accent features that you hear from other languages and cultures, including predominantly India. So that's a major thing that I was aware of while I was there. Within Trinidad and Tobago, it's not just one accent, as well as within the region itself, it's not just one accent or dialect. So while I was there coaching and working with students, it was very interesting because there's such an emphasis, I feel, in America of having this general or generic American accent. And we have, of course, standard British, which we associate with RP or now, I suppose, more modern models like estuary. But nevertheless, it was impossible to have some sort of standard accent across the group. And I didn't seek that because it felt very much like I would be putting an American aesthetic on the work, which, of course, is sort of the problem to begin with. Right. (laughs) So often is this this idea of colonization. So when it comes to teaching actors, which uh, all three of us do, teaching actors the accents and dialects of the Caribbean, it's almost impossible. There, there's a universe, a cosmology of, of, of languages and dialects in the region. That's certainly how I feel. Many of my students are coming from public schools. Jamaican is their mother language. You know, when they go to school at three or four or five years, you start teaching them, speaking to them in English. So there is like a very fluid boundaries between the Jamaican Creole and the standard English. And then some of them think, okay, I am speaking English, but they have many elements from Jamaican. This might be a really good time for us to take a listen to Shakespeare's Sonnet 29 that you recorded. One of your students, Tori Ann King, recorded. I'm going to play that right now for you. Lovely. Hello, my name is Torian King, and I'll be doing Sonnet 29 in Jamaican Creole. When in a disgrace with fortune and many I, my turn all by myself and my weak me outcast state, and trouble death heaven with my bootless cry, and look upon myself and cuss my fate, wishing me like for one more rich in a hope. Feature like him, like him with friend possess. Desiring this man art and that man scope with what me most enjoy, contented least. Yet, in a these thoughts for myself, almost despising, happily me think upon you, and then me state like to the lack of break of the arising from sullen earth. Sings hymns of heaven gate for thy sweet love, member such wealth bring that then must scorn for change my state with kings. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed. Desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. So, Elizabeth, when you listen to Tori Ann King reading Sonnet 29 in what she identifies as Jamaican Creole, what are we hearing exactly? Jamaican Creole is an oral language that it doesn't have a written system. 
and is not taught in schools is the nation language because everybody speaks Jamaican Creole everywhere. Even politicians, sometimes they speak in Jamaican when they want to attract voters. But everybody speaks Jamaican. So what's, the so, what's the difference between Patois and Creole? Well, it's the same. Okay. The Creole always was seen as a lesser language. It has less prestige. Uh, so there are many negative attitudes associated <laughs> with the, the Creole, the Jamaican Creole, like uh, called broken language, for instance, and Koth, et cetera, et cetera. But in my class, I create a workshop to discuss the linguistic situation in Jamaica. They discover, okay, Jamaican from the linguistic point of view is a language because it has a grammar and a syntax, has a big lexicon adopted from standard English, but it's a language in itself. From 2008, for instance, the, the Society of the Bible in Jamaica decided to translate the Bible and then finished this project in 2012. Let's, let's listen to your other student. Uh, this is uh, Joan McKenzie reading Luke 5, verse 12. Let's hear, let me read it in English. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing... You can make me clean. And here's John McKenzie reading it in Patois or Jamaican Creole. One time when Jesus did in our town, one man come to him where one sickness to make him skin fussy fussy. When him see Jesus, him go down upon him knee, put him face a ground and beg him say, Lord, if you want to cure me and make me clean, you have the power to do it. That's great. I was intrigued by his skin was fussy fussy. Can you unpack that? You see, in Jamaica, there is this method of creating new words is reduplication. If you want to say, for instance, uh, that is very yellow, you say yellow, yellow. Yes. In this case, is the um, the skin uh, was in very bad state, like fussy. So they will say fussy, fussy. In carnival context, they have borrowed from diable, diable. They have jab, jab, a character that these names are adopted also using the same same sort of process. Dylan, let's switch to the recording that you suggested that I bring along. My exploration of the Caribbean began with Trinidad and is rooted there, but I'm very interested in exploring festival drama in the surrounding islands. So whenever I have the opportunity, I visit one, try to get a few dialect and or accent tapes out of it, and uh, this is one of those. This is from Curacao. It's such, what is the word that I'm thinking of? Kalaloo is the only thing that comes to mind, like a soup. You know, it's a big soup of accent features from uh -huh. various places. And this speaker also speaks Papiamento, which is spelled with a U or an O at yeah. the end of that word. And we discussed that earlier briefly, Elizabeth did. So we have a quick sample speaking English and then also a bit of that. I have now 13 years here in Curacao, but I have born in Bonaire. Um, I have, I was some um, 90 years in Holland for my study, then I came back to Bonaire, then now I'm in Curacao for 13 years. Um, I'm here without families. I'm alone here, so it's sometimes it's difficult for me. I have to thank God that we have the facility for using the cell phone so I can connect with my family all the days. But for me, Curacao is a great island, great island for tourists, and like, it's a place, place to be for me in the ABC island, and I'm living alone. And Curacao, what we can offer here for like beaches, we have nice beaches, and nightlife also is great here. So it's the place to be also when you want a good vacation on a warm island. Klein Corso is a little bit of 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 a
So within yeah. that sample, I mean, uh-huh. there's, I hear a lot of features that I would not express as Caribbean features. But there are some things that are found in all three of these samples that I shared with you, like the lip rounding on that now vowel. No. The idea yes. of, yes, yeah, the idea of, you know, um, switching from something like, a, like an interdental sound, something more like the alveolar ridge, where you get theta to more like a T's and D's, that sort of idea. But also, I, I'm hearing some very interesting other features that I would not say are necessarily caribbean where do they come from in this particular speaker then well we've got nine years of education with holland right okay so i'm hearing features that i think are there but also drawing it back this interesting idea of dropping his h on holidays was fascinating to me and not a feature that i often associate with a caribbean dialect until we heard that in sonnet 29 a hard more glottalized attack on that h i thought was fascinating so i don't know where that phoneme is is coming from and additionally of course this speaker might be slightly code switching for me to make me feel comfortable as an american this is another characteristic of jamaican speakers is the code switching code switching yes yeah so there are two languages interacting this jamaican and standard english and then so the standard English is seen as to be used in more formal situations and with foreigners. And then Jamaica is used more with a family and friends and social situations, social scenarios. Um, so all this has to do with the communicative competence, how much they know English and how much they know Jamaican. Of course, Jamaican, they know more Jamaican, so they don't know exactly when to speak Jamaican, when not to speak Jamaican, where to speak it, to whom, what to talk about. For instance, the the jokes. (laughs) You Uh see, the most difficult aspect for me, for instance, to be funny in English is very difficult. (laughs) And the same is for Jamaicans, yeah. It brings up the question of whether... A visiting outside anthropologist or visitor of any kind actually can at any point hope to access the culture as it exists among the residents. You have to find your techniques to do it. Have you been there long enough to be admitted as initiated and able to access the culture as it exists? I would say in some aspects, but for instance, the fact that my skin looks lighter and my accent Spanish accent so still I'm seen as a foreigner I have my Jamaican passport you know Mm -hmm. but still I'm seen as a foreigner because Caribbean is a matter of culture of history of all the things that the you as a race have to endure to to be what you are now so the language is part of your identity it's part of who you are Creole speakers identify with the language at a deeper level. The relationship with the language goes from intimate to social and to formal interaction. So it will be hard to find the real Jamaican speech if you don't talk to them and explain to them what is what you want to do. And if what you are doing is something that is going to help them in some way, they will do it. Mm-hmm. This might actually be a decent time to drop in that Barbados sample that discusses code switching between islands and between foreigners and outsiders. I, I do the switch in a sense. When I am in Bridgetown, the, the, the way in which I speak, it will be a little faster. It's definitely more Bridgetown and, and even the words I may use. As opposed to when I'm here now, it's more Trini. So de- depend on who I'm talking to. So for, even when I go to do research, um, because of my field, it's, it's, it's normal people, you could say. So I do not go with standard English. And, you know, I talk, especially if they're young and they're artists in the industry, you know, you, you talk with them no, normal, or as Chinese would say, normal. I'm sure you've heard that phrase. <laughs> normal. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it actually helps people to be more comfortable with you. Read that in your voice, please, from your transcription. Sure. I, I do the switch in the sense, when I am in Bridgetown, the, the way I, in which I speak, it will be a little faster. It's definitely more Bajan. 
and and even the words I may use, as opposed to when I'm here now, it's more Trini. So it depends on who I'm talking to. So for even when I go to do research, um, because of my field, it's it's normal people, you would say. So I do not go with standard English. And, you know, I talk, especially if they're young and they're artists in the industry, you know, you, you talk with them normal. Or as Trinis would say, again, I will say personally from Dylan's voice, normal. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm sure you've heard that phrase, normal. So <laughs> yes. it actually helps people to be more comfortable with you. So, yeah. so what about your experience in Trinidad and Tobago in in accessing the culture at the, the, at the deepest level that you want to as a researcher? For me, the key was that my real connections were not made when I was saying, I'm here to talk about your voice and speech work. My connections that were of the greatest value were made when I said, I'm here and I'm working on Carnival. I'm interested in working with robbers specifically, which is why I was there. Carnival characters, there's a whole pantheon of traditional characters drawn from various cultural influences. But I went specifically to look at Midnight Robbers. It's a storytelling tradition that is borrowed largely from West Africa, from the Griot, storytelling traditions of West Africa. It involves themes of contestation, which is sort of what Carnival is about. Rebirth, contestation. So these Trinidadian Midnight Robbers will essentially have text battles to prove who is a better robber. You have a scout whistle to get attention. And during carnival, this would actually be played out in either a carnival yard or on the street with direct address to the audience and to anyone who challenged you in essentially a battle. Not unlike what I would think of as a rap battle. And these boastful statements are enormous. I grind my enemies into powder. Or when I passed through the Sahara forest, all trembled. And someone would reply, wait, the Sahara forest? And they would say, well, it used to be a forest. It was a desert when I passed because of the immense power of my death bringing, you know, this sort of (laughs) idea. So this boastful tradition was something that I really enjoyed. Also in the fact that in Carnival, there is a tradition of playing mass and satirizing and speaking through a mask seems to me initially counterintuitive. Why would you emphasize voice and speech work and then mask yourself? And of course, that has everything to do with what we've discussed in terms of colonialization, in terms of the idea of having a a mask can be freeing, you know, playing mass. My best accent samples, I think, are taken from my best friends in Trinidad, who I have the opportunity to really emphasize the work that I'm attempting to do. And after a long time of playing robber or working with them, then eventually attempting to have like a real understanding, uh, a better understanding of the range of clarity that they're using and the sacrifices that they are making for my outsider ear. Mm -hmm. Let's switch topics to, by contrast with Carnival, you're working with the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus on Oedipus Rex. I think that is rather similar to what Elizabeth does at the Edna Manley School in Kingston in documenting the encounter of Caribbean folks with European classic texts. Yeah, well, with that, right, we're talking about, okay, so how many cultures can we, can we wrap into one time? I'm a voice and text director for, the, for a production. I'm an American, brought up on a system of English that is heavily influenced by stage English. And then we have Trinidadians, as well as other people from Montserrat, Barbados, uh, surrounding areas, doing a play that is Greek, translated by a British guy, borrowed from other translations as well. So it's like, could we have anything more going on right now? And we didn't at any point. And if I had, it would have been me putting an aesthetic on top of this. I think 
what was most useful in terms of me being there, honestly, was, well, if you can land this selection with clarity and intent so that I understand it clearly, your audience will absolutely understand it clearly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this basic notions of storytelling, I think, were what I was able to best assist with. And the idea of, well, what's going to be operative? What's going to be important in these phrases? The opportunity to work on that piece was, was really wonderful for me. I yeah. bet. I bet. Elizabeth, your research focuses on Jamaican performers encountering standard English texts. Am I correct? Am I putting it right? Why, when my students speak in Jamaican Creole, they are so expressive and have so many vocal skills, and then when they are given a standard English text, they become like smaller, and their vocal expression is really hampered. In my research, I asked them, so how comfortable they feel when they speak, uh, when they perform a text in Jamaican Creole, and how comfortable they feel when they perform in standard English. But then the problem was the the relationship with the language. It's a relationship that is external and that doesn't speak for what they are as Jamaicans. When I work, for instance, with um, sonnets, I have to first to talk about the difference between Jamaican Creole and English and that they notice the differences, the syntactic and grammatical differences, and also phonological. And for them, it's like an eye-opener. Say, why they never told us that? And they are now, you know, in college. First, is talk about the language and then about the words. And then, are, so it's like the sonnet is like a pretext to teach them about language and use of language and the history of English, the history of Jamaican Creole. And then they translate the, the sonnets into Jamaican and it's amazing the difference. So they know about the language and they understand that their language is a language and they have to be feel comfortable to know that. My work is not about make them speak perfect standard English but is to establish a relationship with the words and the meaning and what does it mean for them, those words. So in that way, they can bridge those differences between the phonological system of Jamaican Creole and standard English. I think it's important to understand when working with the Caribbean people that their languages are coming from oral traditions. And so they cannot see their language written they they don't use their language uh, in the schools. It's not the language of instruction. So it's important to understand uh, where their language is coming from. Thank you very, very much, guys. It's been a real pleasure having you both join Thank me today. You. Thank you very much. And thanks to you for joining the three of us. Elizabeth montaya Steeman, Dylan Paul, and me, Paul Meyer. Join me next time when my guest will be Phil Thompson, co-founder of Knight Thompson Speechwork. We're going to talk about speech rhythm, both in everyday conversational prose and in verse drama. Question. Do the greatest speakers exert an irresistible power over their listeners with a secret weapon? Rhythm? Find out next time on In a Manner of Speaking.